has the need for elders. And um, Clifford, would you come up, please? If you guys didn't know that Clifford, because you know who Clifford is, he's the one singing almost every Sabbath from this little podium that we have. Now, Clifford has been an elder, well, since I've been here from January 1. And um, he was a previous elder at the same congregation, the Williston Church. And um, we are here this morning just to, to dedicate Clifford's efforts and office in this church to the Lord and dedicate him to the Lord so that he can work together with the church and the Holy Spirit in ministering to you guys. Now, I'm going to read out of God's Word to you where Paul spoke about what it is an elder does. He says, this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires good work. A bishop then must be blameless. Now, here comes the thing that I think Clifford's really interested in. But the husband of one wife. Only one, Clifford. Okay. Let's be clear about that. Temperate. That I've seen, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence, for if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of, a, of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. This is a mouthful. But for what is applicable to you and what I have seen and uh, what the church board has seen and um, what most of you who I spoke about Clifford have seen, you are in agreement that he fits the profile which is applicable to him. Now, the definition of ordination is, and this is a broad definition that is given in, well, a little book we call Pastoral Ministry. It says, ordination is a process by which individuals are consecrated. So, basically, it would be Clifford that would be consecrated prayed upon, laid hands upon, so that God will intervene in his life, but also support him in his office in the church. It said, that is set apart to be elevated from laity class to the clergy, local elders, which is what is being done today, or bishops, deacons and deaconesses, who are thus then authorized to perform and assist clergy in various religious rites and ceremonies. The process and ceremonies of ordination vary by religion and denomination and is performed by prior ordained clergy or the local ordained clergy of a local congregation. Now, let's come to your work. There's always work involved. So, the first one is, you assist the local church in church services, meaning that you will be 
behind a pulpit and behind a podium when it comes to Sabbath school and sermons. Uh, you will be as a local clergy to a local congregation where the normal clergy, the pastoral staff of a conference would be in a district. And you will conduct these services according to how God has called you to do. The second thing is you foster tithing and you partake in it. So you return tithe to God and his church, and you teach others in that regard. Uh, you will be the one that teaches them the fundamentals, but you would also be the one that teaches the congregation or the members in spiritual things that's been added to your list. And the last one is, and it's not by any means a small thing, but it is that you should give Bible studies to those that want Bible studies. You should conduct prayer meetings, which you already do, because he's the head of our prayer department here as well, and he's been to a prayer retreat, is it what they call it? It's basically a convention of the conference, which you guys will hear about and will be implemented in our church also. Because we are a house of prayer, aren't we? But you will also have spiritual endeavors and attend to the spiritual needs of this congregation. Because this congregation is the one that's backing you. Now, the dedication of an elder is a special thing. The dedication of a local elder gives the church the opportunity to recognize that Clifford would be one of the pastoral staff of the local church. And it is nothing small in meaning. You see, if you have a problem, I'm not available you don't want to speak to any other elder, but you have the confidence to speak in confidence. You can speak to Clifford. He's also ordained to be ministering to you in spiritual needs, in teaching, but also is there to support you. You see, although this is an elevated house that he holds, or position that he holds, it is a position of service. And Clifford is standing next to me this morning to ensure and to make it clear to this congregation that he is in service of you that he'll do his utmost best, that he will serve you as a spiritual leader of this congregation, of this membership, of the Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Williston. Now, I'm going to do a dedicative prayer, and he's going to kneel on the stage, but I'm asking and inviting all ordained elders and clergy pastors to come up front and lay their hands upon Clifford as to dedicate him to this office and to this church as being a spiritual leader here. Clifford, would you kneel before us? You just let you just lay hands upon him. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, what a privilege it is to serve in your church here in Williston. But Lord, this morning we want to dedicate a young man that has vigor for you, that has a real passion to serve in your vineyard. Lord, although this is 
a small congregation. It is yours. And you add to this congregation not only by souls, but also by spiritual gifts. Lord, this congregation, this membership, this church of yours, leading the people of the Williston Seventh-day Adventist Church, Lord, and leading your people in spiritual matters. We thus dedicate this young man to you and to the work. We dedicate him that you would be leading him, that your Holy Spirit will carry him upon its wings, and that you will be with him, Lord, as he ministered to your children, as he serve this congregation as he serve you in this congregation. Lord, may you be with Clifford. And we understand and know that this dedication is a sole covenant between you and Clifford this morning. And Lord, we also understand that the church has now been added to this covenant in supporting Clifford in his position. And this we humbly pray, humbly pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, Clifford, here is a, something that you can just show and remember this dedication by. Thanks. Thank you. And he's got a beautiful voice. You guys are going to hear it now. He's going to have a special item as well. Clifford, would you come and sing up front? Thank you. 
appreciate if you guys could pray for me. I'm having trouble with my right eye. It keeps wanting to water. At this time, I would like to welcome the online audience. We have Pastor Sarl Smith today here to speak, but he has chosen uh, for scripture the scripture reading today, Matthew 10, 34 through 42. And I'm reading from the uh, New King James Version. This section starts out, Christ brings division. Verse 34, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring a peace, but a sword. For I come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And in a man's foes will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Continuing on in verse 38. And he who does not take his cross and follow me after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of the disciple of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. Pastor Smith. Before we begin, let's just bow our heads for another word of prayer. Loving Father, Lord, as we're going to minister to your children, we're going to minister to to those that have came to worship you, to have fellowship with you. Lord, thus I'm asking to put me in the background. Let you come forward and speak to your children. And this I humbly pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon title is My Humble Offer. Now, if you read through the Bible, in the Old Testament, that we have an offer system. Yes, there was an offer given. Now, you would say in the New Testament, what happened? Who was the offer? There's only one answer in the church. That is Jesus. That's the correct answer. Am I correct? So, who was the offer in the New Testament? Jesus. He was the offer. He fulfilled what the Old Testament foreshown. Now, Although that happened, what are we bringing in our lives to show what Jesus had done in our lives and for our lives? And this is what I'm trying to portray with this little heading on the sermon. But I'm going to read yet again from Matthew 10. And 34 to 42, and it reads like this in the New King James Version. It says, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have came to set man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me 
is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. He who receives you receives me. And remember this, these words. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little, little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly, I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. Do you know who that is? He's a well-known character in, well, Earth's history until now. His name was Martin Luther. Now, how many of you knew that Martin Luther was a professor of theology? He gave class in theology at the University of Wittenberg in Germany. Uh, you all remember him by the 95 theses of indulgence which he nailed on the door of the Wittenberg Church in Germany. And that actually gave the big roll around to the Reformation that we are here about. Because we worship in a Protestant church. Am I correct? Are we still protesting in a Protestant church? I've got one yes and other. So um, I gather, let me say it then. We are still protesting. I can promise you. We are there. We, we're still protesting and um, we're protesting against the filtered gospel versus the unfiltered gospel, which is the true word of Jesus Christ in this world. But Martin Luther, when he began his career as a professor, he walked down the corridors, the big corridors of the Wittenberg University. And then the dean of faculty came past him, didn't recognize him because he was a youngster and you needed to be acclaimed and really old to give a class in theology. Because the older you are, they deemed the wiser you were. And he turned around and said, who are you, sir? And Martin Luther said, well, I'm the new theology teacher. And they said, well, you need to learn politics before you can go into a class and give people a lesson. Now to Martin Luther and basically to me when I read that, that was an absurd thing to say for a theology professor. Do we really need to have politics to give the word to people? Because then I'm also in the wrong profession. I'm not a politician. And just a little secret from me to you, I don't want to be a politician. Um, and neither did Martin Luther. Now, you know what the history tells you about Martin Luther. He didn't play politics. He actually stood up for what was right. That's what he did. He nailed the thesis on that door just because politics were in play to get money for an addition at a place where he didn't even minister. And that was forced upon him. So he stood up for the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
But also to remind you that in those days, the normal people, the laity of the day, didn't have the opportunity to have this printed book in their hands. They needed to rely on the priests and the professors to tell them what the Word of God really entailed. So, the gospel was filtered through a lens or through a sieve that was political of nature. But Martin Luther stood up and take a stand against that. Now, Daniel 1, 8 to 16. Now, and don't go into another way or into the eating habit of it. I'm not going there. I just want to portray something to you. And after reading this, I'm going to tell you what it is. But it goes in the New King James Version as, But Daniel proposed or purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who has appointed your food and your drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger the head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of eunuchs had sent, set over Daniel, Aniah, Mishal, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young man who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. And you see, and as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them ten days. And at the end of the ten days, their futures appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Verse 16 says, Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine, and they were to drink and gave... Uh, Sorry, and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. What did Daniel do? What was his main purpose with this? Now, in those days, if you were a heathen king, what would be the best plate of food on your table? This big and it's got an apple in its mouth. A little piglet. But Daniel was a? <laughs> Daniel was a Jew. The Jewish people eat pork? No. So they didn't want to defile themselves before God. Just because they were in a situation which could have given them a way out to do what they needed to do and still say it wasn't our fault that we needed to eat that. So Daniel stood up for what he believed in. He stood up for God. And unfortunately, there's a little song that we sing to our children almost every Sabbath. Dare to be a Daniel. But yet again, our children 
don't listen quite well. Have you gathered that? Children don't listen well. Am I correct or aren't I correct? They really don't listen. Now, when I grew up in South Africa, we had a saying in, in Afrikaans that basically meant these are just vases next to your head. They mean nothing, which is true. We got disciplined more times than we can remember just because we didn't listen. But you know what? Kids are wired like that. They don't listen. They will never listen. And each time a kid grows up and has kids of their own, you'll recognize yourself when you were little in those little faces. But kids do mimic examples. They do watch examples. They do see and they do do what you show them to do. Now, when we came to the States, one thing that frustrated me quite a bit was, if you, and when you come to another country and you immigrate to another country, you need to get some furniture in your house. Otherwise, you're going to have to sit on the carpet and sleep on the carpet. So you go and you buy furniture, and then they deliver the furniture in a box. And then you need to buy tools, which nobody tells you, just to fix up the furniture or get the stuff assembled to sit on. Now, I am going to be vulnerable today and tell you I'm not mechanical whatsoever. If I assemble something, please do not sit on it. Because it will break and you will fall and you will probably sue me. So please do not sit on it if I assemble something. I'm not good at that. But when I open the box, I get this little, I don't know what you want to call it. It's a little cardboard with little plastic pouches and you get the screws in one plastic pouch and another screw. In, and then you get this big love letter in it with little pictures and just two or three sentences, what you need to do. Call the instructions. I cannot follow the instructions. But I could if somebody sat next to me and said, you take this, you do this, and you do that, and you fasten this, then I can do it. The kids are exactly the same. If you give them instruction manual and say, please don't do that, please don't do that, please don't do that, guess what? They're going to do that. Why? Maybe they're curious. Maybe they, they need to experience something for themselves. Maybe you didn't show them not to do that. Did the Israelites throughout the Old Testament been the best of nations towards God that ever lived. No, they were horrible. Just think when Moses went up the mountain, what did they do? They made another God. What was the purpose of the prophets? Going to the nation of Israel and say, turn back to God, you're wandering off. So they needed to get back to God. What did Christ come and do? He gave us an example. We need examples. We need examples in life. Now history has given us the Martin Luther's has given us the Wesleys, has given us the John Calvins, has given us the Knoxes, has given us a whole lot of people to refer back to, has given us all the experiences and the examples that we need to take a stand. And let me fast forward a little bit. You see, Martin Luther 
stood up. What happened in 1844? You know there is a date like 1844 that's really important for the Adventist church. Okay, so, so we're, all, we're all there. But what happened in 1844? 1844, sorry. <laughs> the? The great disappointment. Appointment. What gave birth to Seventh day Adventism? That exact, that exact occurrence. Why? You see, did Martin Luther, when he nailed the 95 theses on that door, was he assured about every single little thing that was right in the Word of God? Or was he still swayed in a certain direction? He began the Reformation. But through Bible study. Let, let me say it like this. Maybe that would make a little bit more sense. When the people came together and worshipped together in 1838, they worshipped on a Sunday morning in a Baptist church. There was a lady present in the church called Rachel Oaks. Now, Rachel Oaks went to that church. Why? She was from another denomination, the Seventh-day Baptist Church. And after Bates had his sermon, he greeted everybody at the door. And what happened? She went to talk to him. And she asked him one question. Why do you worship on a Sunday? And he said, well, it's according to God's word. And she says, show me. And could he show her? No. And they did study upon study for basically more than 24 hours. All the clergy. And what did they find out? That the seventh day is the real Sabbath of the Lord. What did those pioneers do? They took a stand. And if it wasn't for them taking a stand, if it wasn't for a lady, and I promise you, a lady didn't have any big say in many things in the 1800s. But if it wasn't for a lady that stood firm in her belief, we wouldn't have been here today. If it wasn't for those that listened to the lady and took the firm belief, a firm stand, we wouldn't have been here today. Matthew 5, 11 to 12 says, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets that were there before you. Persecution. Do you think we still have persecution in modern times? Then I'm going to differ with you. I've been in many people's houses that said, I cannot worship on the Sabbath. I need to work. That's a form of persecution. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's alive. Do we face persecution? Where are we heading to? Unfortunately, 
It's not dead. Persecution is quite alive in the days that we live in. And unfortunately, it's not going to get any much prettier than it is now. It's going to get worse. You're right. But we also need to remind ourselves, in taking a stand, we take the bitter with the sweet. If you believe in the unfiltered gospel of Jesus Christ, if you believe, and you can go through Matthew 24, Christ proclaims that the time of tribulation is coming. He says we only need to pray that it doesn't happen in winter time or on a Sabbath. Now, the winter time I didn't get in South Africa. Yeah, I get it. I pray that it doesn't happen in winter time. I can promise you. But on the Sabbath, why not? Why not? Because if you go back to Genesis, what did God do with the Sabbath day? He hallowed it. Why? You see, do you want to run on a day that is set aside to have fellowship with your Creator? No, you don't want to do that. But you know what? We sometimes think, yeah, we don't want to do that. We'll stand firm with that. But yet, we give way to that day for so many other things. We do what we want on the Sabbath. Nobody's looking. We do what we want. Uh, we go where we want. And we forget that God has hallowed that day just to have fellowship. Just to build on the relationship that he has with you. A relationship which actually crucified him on a cross just to restore. And we don't understand the word hello. And we don't accept that God has created that day for us. It's like accepting the gift and pushing it back in God's hands. So the logical thing to my mind is when that little screw is beginning to tighten, when persecution would come, it won't be so hard not to hallow or respect the Sabbath. Because it's not that hard to disrespect it now. The pen of inspiration says, those who lived during the last days, and listen to this, please listen to this. This is a message God has given to the remnant church, to his church, to the Williston Seventh-day Adventist church. And she wrote, those who lived during the last days, in what days do we live in? Who believes that we are living in the last days? Because if we don't believe that, I'm really going to ask you to read your Bibles yet again. Because the Bible makes it clear that we are in the last days. That what is happening outside is really on the road to the end. And she writes, Those who live during these last days of earth's history will know what it means to be persecuted for the truth's sake. We don't fully comprehend that. We don't fully comprehend what persecution really is. In the courts, justice, injustice will prevail. So there won't be a fairness in this. They won't look at you and say, oh, that's your religion. Sorry. Okay. That's freedom of religion. No, fairness hasn't got a place in this. She goes on by saying, the judges will refuse to listen to the reasons of those who are loyal to the commandments of God because they know the arguments in favor of the fourth commandment 
are unanswerable. What's the fourth commandment? The Sabbath holy. It's the Sabbath. It's a day which God has set aside to have fellowship with you because He wants your relationship to grow with Him. And let's be honest, this, well, is it morning or afternoon? Morning, afternoon. Let's be honest. If you are sitting in this pew, you chose the Sabbath. It wasn't forced upon you. God never forces something upon you. You have chosen to believe the unfiltered gospel. You have chosen to be in this church on a Saturday morning. You have chosen to accept God at His word and to accept the day He has created and hallowed to have this relationship with you. She goes on by saying, They will say, We have a law, but by our law he ought to die. God's law is nothing to them. Our law with them is supreme. Those who respect this human law will be favored, but those who will not bow to the idol Sabbath have no favor shown to them. And this is in Signs of the Times already in 1898. Matthew 10, 40 to 44 says, He who receives you receives me. He who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives... One of these little ones, only a cup of cold water, in the name of a disciple. Assuredly, I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. You're going to ask me why I choose this passage. Have we received Christ in our hearts? Have we received Christ as our salvator? Yes, we have. We've accepted Christ as the one that gave us salvation. We agree. Are we sure that the Sabbath is the Sabbath? Are you guys really sure about that? Are you sure that Saturday is the seventh day in the week and that's the Sabbath? Some calendars are a little bit foggy about that. So, are you sure the seventh day is the Sabbath, which is the Saturday? Okay, if you're sure, are you sure you're in the right church? You agree with that? Are you sure that the right church is the remnant church Revelation is speaking about? You need to think about these things. Are you sure that it is? Because if you are sure it is, then you need to be sure that we also have a prophet. Are you sure about that? And if you accept the prophet, what would you get according to this? A prophet's reward. What is a prophet's reward? What is a prophet's reward? Have you ever thought about that? What is a prophet's reward? What's a prophet's reward in this world? Condemnation, tribulation, anything that can hurt the prophet. Why? Why? Does the devil like people to know about God's church? Does the devil like people to have a relationship with God? Does the devil like people worshiping? The Almighty God. No. He doesn't like it. So just because you have accepted Jesus Christ, you have accepted 
the day of restoration, which is a Sabbath that restores your relationship with Him, just because you worship the Almighty God and you listen to a messenger from God, which is a prophet, you are an enemy to the adversary. And you know what? You chose it because God doesn't coerce you into anything. He gave you free will. But with free will, we need to take a stand. If you are a person that doesn't keep their word, what are you called? A liar. A hypocrite. Choose wisely and stand by your choice. He who receives me. Have we ever, ever went to a place which we deemed as a church that we felt, I don't feel loved in this place. I feel a coldness. Have you ever been to such a place? Have you ever been to, let's, be, let's call it what it is, spade a spade. Have you ever been to a church that felt loveless? Have you ever been to a church like that? My brothers, my sisters, if you have been to a church that is a loveless church, please do not make the sanctuary that you are worshiping in the same as a cold, loveless church. Because God gave us just basically two commandments. Just to love God, love human beings. And according to mainstream Christianity these days, there's a third one, and judge them. But I promise you, the unfiltered gospel gave you only two. Love God, love your brother and your sister. Wherever you are, you are the example. You are the one God has entrusted people to. If somebody comes in that door toward this church... It's your responsibility to make that person feel welcome, loved, and recepted warmly. And for some of us, it is a real struggle. We aren't that personality. But you know what? It's still a commandment. It's still something we need to do. Because you would experience... Exactly the same blessing that person would experience if you accept them into the house of God warmly. Matthew twenty two thirty seven says, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. He goes on by saying, and listen to this. The second one, he says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. As yourself. Who hates themselves? No, please don't put up your hands, otherwise I need a visit. But nobody likes to hate themselves, do you? If you love yourself, And if you realize that you're created in His image, why don't you love the others that's also created in God's image? Love one another. These are the commandments and the law and the prophets is hung upon them. Love God in His creation. I don't need to say much more. We had Linda's morning excellent Sabbath school teacher taught us about loving God's creation. Dominion doesn't mean killing everything beforehand. Dominion means caring for things in this world. You see this image. 
And I know this image should be an image of hope, and it is. It is. But you know, sometimes when I look at this image, I realize that it's my fault, that it's my sin that did that. And if God did that for me, if he died on a cross due to my foolishness, due to my sins, due to the things I do or did, I need to take a stand in my faith. I need to be the one that stand up for God and His glory. I need to be the one that proclaims His word from the mountain tops to the people that is so seeking hope in this world. Because I'm favored. I know the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've got a Bible. I understand His love, His mercy. I'm saved through His power. And if we realize that, you won't even think about it. You would stand up for God and His righteousness each and every single time. Because He did that for you. This is true love. This is true love. It's pure love. To give you and me the opportunity to not only be saved from a life that would end in this realm, but to be with Him in a heavenly sanctuary. This is true love. For what we have done, it's true love. It, it goes beyond what, what my mind can comprehend. This is what God did for us. Amen.
worship you as we came to be spiritually fed, Lord. You have guided us. But Father, as we look upon this earth's history, as we look upon what the bastions of faith did in taking a stand for you, your gospel, and building your kingdom here on earth. Lord, we want to be counted among those. We want it to be, to be a, those that bring your gospel to those that need to hear it, Lord. Lord, we also understand the gravity of what you did for us. The gravity of what the cross really resembles. And Lord, we want to be useful in your hands. We want to be led by you. We want to foster that relationship with you, Lord. But Lord, we need your help with it. We're merely human beings. We're merely human beings that struggle from day to day. But we also have an almighty God that we can turn to. And that we are thankful for, Lord. That you have counted us privileged to be called sons and daughters of the almighty God. Lord, may you be with us this week. May you be with us until that glorious day when you come to take us home. The day that we yearn for. But Lord, also, may you carry us in the days that seem so dark that we can't find the light switch. Lord, thank you for all your mercy, your graces. But most of all, Lord, thank you for the love, the enduring love that saved us. And this we humbly pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen.